Okay, and in preparing this presentation, I realized as well how daunting a task I'm gonna have today, given the emphasis on evidence, because how little is actually known as far as the performance enhancing effects are concerned, because that is really what my emphasis is today, looking at the, um, the evidence for performance enhancement in Olympic and Paralympic um, athletes. And I'm sure you wouldn't be very pleased if I summarize my talk in 10 seconds and say there's no evidence. Um, and it's the first time I'm, I'm, I'm involved in an interactive presentation like this. Um, I think it's incredibly exciting to do this. Um, but in case I don't keep you all awake until the end, I thought it's a good idea to start off with my conclusion. Um, and I'd like to start off by saying there is limited evidence to satisfy me. And I'm being very careful how I term this here because I'm a scientist. I'm not a, I'm not a member of WIDA per se. I, I, I sit on this committee, as you heard from Michael. Um, uh, and as a scientist, I need to uh, uh, look at the evidence before making my decisions. So there's limited evidence to satisfy me for worthwhile performance enhancement in sport. And I'm using inverted commas here for worthwhile, and I'll, I'll explain a bit later what I mean by worthwhile performance enhancement. There's clearly evidence of doping in sport, that we can be sure about. There's evidence that anti-doping agents are getting better at catching the cheats. There's a lot of evidence, and the work that Michael and his team are doing at UCAD is, is very, very impressive. Need for more evidence-based performance enhancement research is one of my key messages, um, which doesn't appear to be getting out, so I hope you also try and help me get that message out. And the last point is what Michael alluded to, and I'm not gonna present any of our data today, but what I can tell you, the next generation um, of testing, hopefully, will involve what we call systems biology, some of you may be doing that, and using the very interesting omics technologies. And I can just tell you one statement on what we are doing so far, is that at least two levels of the omics cascade are producing some absolutely amazing results, which I cannot talk about at the moment. Uh, that's for next year, maybe. Okay, for the structure of my talk, therefore, and forgive me for being so close, I, I actually need to see the slides. Um, I'm gonna start off just summarizing some of the things that Michael said, and I'm not gonna duplicate what he said, but I want to try and illustrate to you some of the difficulties um, that we have as the list committee in making recommendations. Um, and I'd really like one of Michael's interactive questions on the criteria uh, to be reassessed at the end of my lecture and see whether we get different results. So please, if uh, Francesca can organize that slide so that at the end we can re-ask the first interactive question that Michael asked on the criteria, because I have some strong views about that, but um, let's wait and see. Um, I'm gonna then talk about the adverse analytical and atypical findings, because as I've already indicated to you, there's not a lot of evidence. So I'm gonna use uh, this data as a proxy of what may be happening as far as performance is concerned. If athletes are doing it, does it actually work, okay? Um, then I will talk a little bit about the research evidence, and remember, my emphasis is on performance. Please remember that, okay? And I can already tell you there's very little research on this, and I could literally summarize that in 10 seconds. Um, and finally, if we have time, we may touch on the way forward, and again, through some interaction, get your views on this as well. So a lot to try and cover in 30 minutes that I've been given. Okay, so if you go to the, the wider webpage, this is like one of the pages you'll get, and I won't describe what the prohibited list does, because Michael has done that quite eloquently. Um, and you can also actually get the list on your iPhone, so if you want, and you can actually do that. Um, but um, just summarizing again the role of the list expert group, which is now the term we use. It's not the list committee any longer, Michael. It's actually the list expert group. Um, uh, and this is roughly what it does. I just want to stress the one term that, I, that Michael did mention, and that is that we make recommendations only. So we recommend what should or should not go on the list, but others make that decision. So if you don't like the decisions, uh, don't shoot the messenger here, okay, um, in one sense, okay? Um, what Michael didn't mention is the World Anti-Doping Code, uh, which again you can read by going onto the website, which basically tells you about the rules of engagement. And again, I won't go through that, but you can look that up in your own time. Um, but I want to readdress briefly those criteria 
that, that Michael mentioned to you in view of actually reassessing them again in this audience. And the first one that he mentioned, okay, is highlighted here, and this is taken directly from the, the, the code, is potential to enhance or enhances sport performance. And I think the key word here, as you'll appreciate, is potential, okay? Now, one could argue, if you use the word potential, it almost is an unlimited list. But you should keep certain things in mind when deciding whether you think something should go on that or not. And the term I used before, which I want to develop a little bit, is this notion of worthwhile performance enhancement. Worthwhile for what, okay? Well, I would like you to consider this. The smallest enhancement of performance that would make a difference to an athlete's chances of getting the gold. Okay, that is what I would consider as being very important. But you may say, actually, we don't care what you think. Okay, well, that's fine. Um, and a few years ago, um, in 1999, the, the, the fifth IOC World Congress of Sports Sciences came up actually with that statement, which I actually support. And there's the statement again. And if you look at this uh, abstract from uh, this publication by Patton and Hopkins, um, and go straight to the, the last sentence in the abstract, it states, worthwhile enhancements on the basis of variation in competitive performance aim for at least 0.5 to 1.5% for elite track and field athletes or 0.8% for elite Olympic triathletes. That is what is considered worthwhile, okay? Right. However, all the scientists in this room, okay, uh, for physiological type research that we do, you'll know that we use the P level of 0 0.05 to come up with our significances. So if we're going to try and be, a, a, um, we're a member of the expert list group and want to make objective decisions, we need to base it on scientific outcomes and papers. But the papers use a different level of significance. And again, those of you who want to read up about the, this whole notion of the significance test, the controversy, and so on, this is a nice book that you could read, and there's been a lot of debate about the level of significance one should use. Um, the other thing to consider when it comes to this worthwhile uh, improvement, okay, is this excellent analysis conducted by Amanda Cox in the New York Times in February of 2010. And some of you may, if you can go onto the internet, you can actually play the game. And she shows, for example, in alpine skiing, uh, here we have the woman's downhill, the winning time is uh, 1.44.19, and you can actually press play here, and it'll actually play tones, how far apart the, the first was from the second, and so on. And you can see here that uh, you have zero seconds here to about 1.5 seconds. Look at the men's super G. The difference is less, much less, than 0.3 of a second. And again, go on there sometime, play, with, play the game, and you can hear remarkable, uh, remarkably how close first, second, third often is. Look at some more examples here. Uh, if we look here at the uh, men's skeleton, look at this difference, about 0.1 of a second, okay? And while I'm going through this, I want you to think about, well, we need to come up with, with compounds that should be prohibited because they are performance enhancing. Well, how does one determine whether something will improve performance by that small amount or can influence that outcome? Have a look here at the winning time here for the men's 1,000 meters. Those little blobs are almost on top of each other. And finally, the one that she used as well here, another one is the short track speed skating. Again, you can see the same thing, uh, same thing here, where for the men's, uh, uh, women's 1,000 here, and for the men's 1,000, how close these times are. So, you can, so I'm illustrating here the, di the difficulty in making these kind of assessments as to what is worthwhile. And you may think I've been selective in what I'm choosing. I'm very much interested in athletics and why the Kenyans and Ethiopians tend to win all the middle and long distance events, and why individuals of West African ancestry typically win all the sprint events, and I spent 10 years studying these guys. But this was a very classic race going back in Paris in 2003 when Elia Kipchoge just beat um, El Garouge, okay, um, in this 5,000 meter race. So the differences are very, very small. And we need to keep that in mind when evaluating whether something should, uh, is performance enhancing or not. 
A lot of us in this room may have watched the Rugby World Cup recently, yes, okay, and would have seen how incredibly well Wales performed, and had, had, it, had it not been for this silly challenge, or maybe the referee getting it all mixed up, I don't know who is right here, Wales may have gone to the final and actually may have actually won the World Cup. Why? What have they done this time that has made them so very different? Well, if you read the press, you'll hear about cryotherapy, Okay, the team went to Poland, minus 120 degrees, okay? Um, and these are the kind of things put forward as may have contributed to the superior fitnesses of the Welsh rugby team, okay? At the end of the day, does it matter if it works or not? The placebo effect, which we all are very clear about, if the athletes think 120 degrees, minus 120 degrees is gonna make them perform better, then does it really matter? Okay, and just to put another example, maybe a bit closer to what you've heard, okay, uh, or maybe even involved in, you would have heard of ice baths being used after, after performing exercise. Maybe some of you even have tried ice baths after exercise, yes? Well, this is Andy Murray's team. Here is Andy Murray and his team here, and clearly his team also want to suffer like he does, okay? And you can see them um, uh, involved in this. And how does ice baths work? Well, let's look at what it says, what it says here, okay? Uh, blah, blah, blah. After the bath, legs fill up with new blood, new blood that invigorates muscle with oxygen and makes the cells function better. Lactic acid is also removed. Wow, these are amazing things that this ice bath is doing, okay? Well, you're a very, very uh, knowledgeable audience, okay? Um, well, is ice bath, are ice baths worthwhile performance enhancing, okay? And my first interactive slide is this, um, and I would like you to interact with me and, and come up. Do you believe that ice baths are performance enhancing? And theoretically, theoretically clearly, could be added to a possible list, okay? Let's see, okay? Have you all had a chance to do that? Okay, let's see what we're getting. All right, 73 say no, fantastic, I say, okay? All right, and let's look at what the literature is telling us. Exactly that. I ah, know you're such a, uh, a, read, a very well-read audience, you've probably read these papers anyway. Um, and here, for example, from subjective reports, five of seven participants from the ice bath group reported feeling more tight two days after games than previously adopting no recovery strategies. So it gets worse. Um, all seven participants in the ice bath group had a negative feeling toward the baths. <laughs> the opposite effect. And you can look at the practical applications, which is don't do this because this could be detrimental. Okay. However, the athletes are doing this. Some of you would have seen Mo Farah recently, double medalist now in the World Championships. He beat, uh, he won the, the 5K here, the gold. He also won uh, silver in the 10K. But look what he's doing, okay? And everyone now is doing ice baths, okay? But what is the literature telling us? Exactly what you reported, okay? That it's not ergogenic. And if anything, the opposite of ergogenic is ergolytic, okay, has a negative effect, okay? Um, so I've tried there to illustrate some of the difficulties that we have, uh, and we also heard from Michael, should we be evaluating these criteria that I'll go through as well on an equal basis? And I keep on asking this question because I'm actually quite new to this. I've only been involved in anti-doping now for, what, two or three years, and I've been on the committee for two years only, and I'm told we have to we have to weigh these quite equally, all right? Well, what is the second one? The second one represents an actual or potential health risk to athletes, okay? Now, I know there's a lot of water in this room, okay, that you can have during break, and you all know that if you drink too much of that, you will die, okay? You know that, hyponatremia and the related issues, okay? So you know that, all right? So when deciding what should go onto the list, we need to take this into account as well. And one of the most uh, talked about uh, 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 group of uh, substances, the anabolic steroids. Um, and what does the evidence tell us as far as the uh, uh, medical issues, okay, or side effects, and how dangerous the anabolic steroids are? 
And this review published a few years ago in 2006, in the title say, are they exaggerated, okay? Um, and those of you, the clinicians in this room would probably use anabolic steroids for a number of good clinical reasons, okay? So from your experience, please evaluate that for, that for me, okay, in the next interactive question. So, are the dangers of anabolic steroid exaggerated? Okay, let's wait and see. Have you got a chance to do that? Well, this will be very, very interesting. Okay, you all had a go, right? Okay. Let's see what we get. 62 say no. Okay, that is, that is very interesting, okay. Let's proceed. Well, let's see what the paper says, okay? And then there's, there's a lot of papers on this, okay? Um, going right here to the conclusion here. Uh, existing data suggests that in certain circumstances, the medical risk associated with anabolic steroid use may have been somewhat exaggerated, possibly to dissuade use in athletes, okay? Now, I'm not making a, a decision here. I'm not, making, I'm not even making a, a personal statement of where, which way I fall in this argument. But I've chosen anabolic steroids because they're so popular in the sense that everyone is talking about them, okay? Or at least among certain groups of, of athletes is being spoken about, the bodybuilders, the weightlifters, and so on, okay? Um, and I do worry at times that um, uh, when there's a lot of uh, talk about side effects and, it, and when there are times where it is being exaggerated, what effect it actually may have on the athletes and what they think of us as scientists as well when we make certain claims that we can't support with scientific evidence. But then again, it is also very difficult to get that evidence as I'm sure you, you know very well. The third criterion, which is a real difficult one for me to really get around my head, Okay, but you're more intelligent than me and maybe you can help me out here, all right? And let's have a look at what it means because Michael presented us this notion of violates the spirit of sport, okay? Well, if I ask every single one of you to write a paragraph on what that means, I'm sure you'll come up with a hundred different paragraphs, okay? But let's see what the code tells us because we have to use the code almost as the Bible, okay? And, um, and let's see what it says here, okay? So, this intrinsic value is often referred to as the spirit of sport. It is the essence of Olympism. It is how we play true. The spirit of sport is a celebration of the human spirit, body and mind, and is characterized by the following values. Ethics, fair play and honesty, health, excellence in performance, character and education, fun and joy, teamwork, dedication and commitment, respect for rules and laws, respect for self and other participants, courage, community, and solidarity. And the final point here to see is that doping is fundamentally contrary to the spirit of sport, okay? This becomes a little bit clearer when you read this, okay? But then again, going back to this notion of two of the three criteria have the word potential, which means you can include almost anything you want. The third one has a, quite necessarily a vague uh, uh, description, but one that could mean different things to different people as to for how, how far you could take this or how, how not so far you could take this, okay? So those are some of the issues that we have as the committee, and I wasn't aware of this. I was also very critical before I joined this committee of, of, of some of the work that's come out of WADA, and also of how, how the, that committee comes up with this list. But now that I'm part of it, okay, I realize how difficult a job it is. Okay, and we have huge debates, which I can't get into for confidentiality, on, 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 on what should be and should not be there. Okay, let me move on because of time to getting more, more back onto the topic, which is this evidence for performance enhancement, okay? And as I've indicated to you, it's very, very difficult to do this kind of research because athletes don't want to come to the laboratory, uh, be given uh, a compound, and to perform at their best. They perform at their best during competition, not in a laboratory, which is what we are trying to do. And I've got to tell you that I spend half the year out in Africa or Jamaica trying to get these world-class athletes to be guinea pigs. And it's very difficult. I can spend six months working with an athlete only to get one sample, 
Okay, um, so it's incredibly difficult to do. So the next best thing is to use this kind of data that is available for all of you to, to look at yourselves. So what am I referring to? Again, if you go onto uh, the, uh, the web page, you can get access to the most recent, which is 2010 Adverse Analytical Findings and Atypical Findings. Just so I don't get this wrong, because I can get into trouble, okay, here is what we, talk, what we mean by adverse analytical findings. Okay, uh, is defined by the World Anti-Doping Code as a report from a laboratory or other wide approved entity that consistent with the International Standard for Laboratories and related technical documents identifies in a sample the presence of a prohibited substance or its metabolites or markers or evidence of the use of prohibited method. Okay, that is what is termed the adverse analytical finding. It is different to the atypical finding which is basically um, uh, a report from the laboratory or other wide approved entity which requires further investigation as provided by blah, 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 and you can read the rest yourselves. Okay, so they're quite different, okay? Um, and from this table, table A from the document, here we have Olympic sports versus non-Olympic sports. Number of samples analyzed, you can see the huge number of samples in, and each time you look at these numbers, imagine the costs involved in doing the analysis, so some 260,000 here. And if you look at the adverse analytical findings, okay, 1,600 here, or 1,166 here, whatever, but roughly talking about 0.9% uh, in Olympic sports here and about 1.5 in non-Olympic sports. Okay, what about the atypical findings? You can see here, uh, roughly similar uh, here, 0.88 uh, here, but lower than what it was for the non-Olympic sports here, uh, and total 0.8, okay? And then if you add the two, you get this column here, okay? So about 1%, which is similar to the data that Michael shared with us early on, okay? What about the different sports? And I'm sorry, this is very small. You can't see this very well, and I don't expect you to go through all this anyway. But these are the different sports, going from aquatics right through to wrestling. The average, I should say, is, as we indicated already, 0.9%. I'm just going to highlight a few sports for you. Weightlifting is the highest here, with 2.4% adverse analytical findings. That's not surprising. I'm from Greece, and the Greek uh, weightlifting team, okay, prior to the last Olympics, the whole team was disqualified because they were all taking drugs, okay, um, which is a real embarrassment for the Greek Olympian uh, ethos and so on, okay. Um, other examples going up here, basketball, 1.45. To me, but somewhat surprising, I would say, but again, is it really telling us anything? Um, um, here we have equestrian, 1.66%, okay? But the point I'm trying to make is it fluctuates about 0.5 to about 1. Point, uh, oh, so the highest there, 2.4, as I've indicated, okay? Are the percentage of analytical findings. And it varies in different sports, as you can see. But you can also see that the number of tests being performed are very different. Look at cycling, some 21,500 samples versus others, for example, here in curling, 477, okay? What about Paralympic sports? Okay, uh, fewer tests, and again, the, the percent of analytical findings is about 1.1%, okay, 1.04%. I must make this point that I'm using these data as a proxy of performance enhancement, okay? But it's not, okay? It is not evidence of worthwhile performance enhancement because the athletes are doing it. And I demonstrated that I thought nicely with the ice baths and, and, and everything else, okay? But it is interesting to look at this data because we don't have anything else for me to present to you. Um, the other thing we can look at, okay, well, what are the athletes actually taking based on this data, okay? And this list is very interesting, okay? Here's the list going right down here, um, the number of samples here, and here we have the percentage of all reported findings. Surprise, surprise, what is right at the top here? Anabolic agents, 61%, it is huge. Okay, look what happens next. Stimulants go down to right down to 10%. Then we have cannabinoids, about 10% as well. Diuretics and other masking agents, 7%. Uh, glucolytic steroids, 4.2%, and beta 2 agonists. And uh, hormones related substances, right down to 2%. I'm not even going to go through the rest because they're so small and insignificant. And I remember as a young student being taught well, if athletes are taking it, it must work. Well, I don't know about that, okay, but that's what the data tells us. 
Um, and if we start breaking this down a little bit more and we look at the anabolic agents, which are the ones that come up to the, uh, to the top of the list? As tenazolol and androlone, and you can see here 10% and 7.4% respectively. Okay, is there any evidence that it's performance enhancement, enhancing? Can you come up with the data? You'll say, well, okay, it's very difficult to come up with that data, but I can tell you there's very little data. But from what your own experience, let's evaluate. What do you think? You've already told me that, that uh, the side effects here have not been overstated, but what about performance effects? Let me know what you think. So are anabolic steroids performance enhancing? And I want you, as you're doing this, to remember the name of the conference, evidence. I'm not actually interested in your gut feeling sometimes, okay? It's your evidence is what I want, okay? Anyway, let's see what you come up with. Okay, waiting. Okay, 67% and 33 say no, okay? Again, very interesting. Again, I can tell you there's very little research to support that. And a most recent paper in 2011 by some of my heroes in the field, okay, these are highly respected uh, scientists from Italy. Let's see what they say, all right? So don't take it from me. The influence of the anabolic androgen steroids on physical performance is still undefined. Since the, since the large number of studies published so far have described discordant and often contradictory outcomes. Nevertheless, animal and human investigations support the hypothesis that administration of these things might increase lean body mass, muscle mass, uh, maximal voluntary strength, especially in men, okay? And, the, and these would represent an appealing form of doping, blah, 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 okay? This is a review that's just come out, okay? Let's move on because of time. The next one is stimulants, okay? Uh, and again, I'd argue the same thing. There's very little evidence out there. Well, let's go to the top of the list to see what we're talking about here. Methylhexan uh, methylhexanamine is right at the top with 21.4%. I can tell you I couldn't find a single paper on this as far as performance enhancement is concerned, and that's probably not too surprising. So let's go on to amphetamines because there are some papers that you can come up with some kind of decision-making process. And on this, trying to think of mechanisms how this could work, some of you will be aware of Professor Timothy Noakes from University of Cape Town's central governor theory that everything in, as far as performance is concerned is determined at the level of the brain. He talks about in this uh, New Scientist article running on empty. Your lungs are bursting, your muscles are screaming to you to stop. Can it really be possible that fatigue is all in the mind? Okay, and clearly this uh, kind of drug could potentially be having the central effect to enhance performance. And Timothy Noakes has published some nice work on how this could possibly work and has presented this, this notion of the central governor hypothesis, which you can read in your own time. So I can see where there may be some, some um, evidence here that one could refer to. Very briefly now, um, cannabinoids. This is an interesting one, okay, about 10%. Okay, the active uh, compound here is THC, you all know that. Um, and very quickly, okay, let's do this interesting one. Is marijuana performance enhancing? Because remember those criteria we're using, okay? All right. Yes or no? I know some of you are saying, well, it depends on the sport. Are they going to throw me off a hill, okay? Um, and go downhill as fast as I can, okay? It makes a difference maybe. Let's see what you're coming up with. Okay. 80% say no. And if your view, therefore, is that these criteria shouldn't be treated equally, and performance should be one of the criteria that is predominantly preferred, or be, it should be the focus, then shouldn't this group be thrown off completely? I'm not saying that, I'm just, just saying that, maybe. Okay? What about the literature? Okay, let's see what the literature is telling us. Okay, and there's some papers on this. You can read them in your own time. But very briefly, studies have demonstrated the use of cannabinoids can reduce anxiety, but it does not have ergogenic potential in sports activities. Again, it can be ergolytic, they say, reducing performance. So why would an athlete want to do this? Unless for social reasons, okay? And again, just finishing off this list, because I don't have time to go through all this. Let's go over to the glucocorticosteroids very quickly, um, and you know all this, so I won't bother with that. What about the glucocorticosteroids, which you, the, the clinicians in the room must use a lot of, okay? So what about them? Are they performance enhancing? Yes or no? You can already appreciate the difficulty we have, because I'm sure you're all struggling to come up with yes or no. 
But what, are, what do you come up with in this one? And we currently have a paper submitted as a group um, led by Fabio Picosi from, uh, led by the, the firms, the International Sportsmen's Federation on this topic. And I won't tell you what we've said in that. Let's see what you come up with. 44 say yes, 56 say no. So interesting, okay? So not clear cut clearly. All right, so I'm not, um, one more here that I will spend just a few moments, if I may, and that is the hormones and related substances. But I remind you here, it's only 1.6%, okay, quite low. Um, and I'm only, because of time, gonna talk about, um, in S2 here, EPO, okay, because it's my favorite drug as a scientist, okay? Um, interested in this. And th th this is from um, this website, which is very popular for, amongst athletes and sports scientists. Uh, it's called the Sports Scientists, okay? And what they show quite nicely, this is the, the performances. The, in blue, the average top 20, and these are in red, the best performance for the five kilometer track event, okay? And, and you can see here, this is the time where uh, EPO was commercially introduced. And you can see there's quite a steeper drop after that point. I don't know what it's telling us, but if it is actually these best times, okay, is down to EPO, I've wasted 10 years of my life studying the Ethiopians and Kenyans, if you think about it, you know, if it's drug-induced, okay? What about the 10K? Very similar phenomenon happening here. Is that evidence of EPO having a positive effect? Well, we were, we've been funded since 2008. Uh, we've been given close to half a million dollars now to study the effects of EPO, and in particular, looking at the omics cascade that I mentioned to you previously, studying 20 East Africans at altitude uh, and 20 sea level um, athletes as well, and um, giving them EPO and seeing what effect it has. And I'll just show you some preliminary data, which I can show you, and this is the hematological parameters, but nothing new here. I'm sure you can gather this is baseline, this is during the drug, this is post drug. You have an increase in reticulocytes, you know that. Uh, hemoglobin goes up from 14 to about uh, close to 17, okay, as you would expect. And measuring total hemoglobin mass using carbon monoxide rebreathing, again, you get this increase. Not only what you probably expect and what you know from your studies that you, and from your clinical practice in anemia and so on. So, what do you think about EPO? Is it performance enhancing? And this will be very interesting, given the amount of publicity this drug receives. So just, just um, make a quick vote on this one. Okay, let me speed up, okay. So let's have a look at what you come up with. And by the way, we're looking for volunteers. So anyone interested in taking EPO for research purposes, please let us know. Okay, what's happening? Okay, 72 say yes, 28 say no. It's interesting, it's still high, 70, say, 70 saying yes, but not everyone, that's very interesting. Well, I can share you some of our data that is just being generated literally as we speak, and this is looking at a three kilometer time trial. These are, uh, are eight individuals, 10.6 uh, seconds, uh, sorry, 10.6 uh, uh, here minutes, okay, and this is 10.06 uh, post, this is after EPO, and four weeks after taking the drug, their performance have not returned to baseline levels. So even four weeks after taking the drug, they're still having some benefit. And I say I can't share with you today the omics data, which is equally exciting what happens four weeks after taking the drug. That's for another day, all right? I'm not gonna go through the rest because so, they're so, uh, the percentage of all reported fines is so low. Um, so that is the, the, somewhat the research evidence, okay? But a little bit more on that, if I may, uh, from published work. This is a study done recently looking at motives for illicit use, published by Jean Billard's group um, uh, in 2011. And there they looked at, two, between 2000 and 2005's, calls to the National Anti-Doping Phone Help Service by cyclists, bodybuilders, and footballers. And look at what they found, okay? In black here is professional. Professional means performance. And in white here, biological, is some parameter of performance, okay? It could be strength, it could be endurance. And yellow is psychological, in green cultural, and in red is relational, like the coach or significant others telling them what to do. And you can see that it's not exactly the same in cycling, bodybuilding, uh, and football. The distribution is somewhat different. Um, and if we just compare, for example, cycling and football, you can see the one that's the highest in cycling is disease, or basically related to, to, um, uh, to the biological component. But if we look at football, the highest 
is here 27.5%, which is social norms and society. You can see different motivation to take, I oh, need to speed up, yes, okay. So you can see different motivation to take the drugs as you can see here. Um, and I'll just bypass that. And clearly in sports like football, um, uh, taking cannabis, for example, is just a reflection of society and, and therefore one could argue should it be on the list or not, okay? Because of time, uh, allow me just to finish off with um, the football example. Um, this is data from FIFA looking at the number of positive tests in 2004 and 2005. These are the number of uh, positives uh, in, in this uh, magenta color in 2004 and this purple color in 2005. You can see the numbers are very, very low that have been found. And listen, listen, look at this quote here. The percentage of positives in UEFA and FIFA is less than 0.1%. In Spain, 0.01% after 25,000 tests. Is this a good way of spending the money? And I'm just going to bypass all that. Sorry, I spent too much time going all these. But I'll end up with one more question for you, and I'll, I'll literally stop after this. And that is what you, Candy Doping, are doing together with the English Football Association. They've unveiled details of a rigorous doping control program at 1,200 tests and so on. Okay, and this, this is what they're going to be doing. And my question to you is, is this a good use of the FA's money? Okay, 60% say no, that is of interest. Okay, and I'll stop there, thank you.